I am Bob Thompson, and I began in June of 1957. Uh, I was a co-op student from Drexel Institute of Technology, and continued all my co-op assignments in Camden in the uh, what was to become the Communication Systems Division and uh, graduated in 61 and after some assignments in uh, Moorestown and Manhattan and Princeton uh, finally got a permanent job in Camden and then quickly uh, became an engineer in the Applied Research Division in Building 10 on the 8th floor, uh, doing uh, designs for video recorders. Okay, so what was your first assignment and how did you feel about it? Well, uh, my first assignment was to, uh, as a co-op student, was to uh, help the engineers develop a better solid state digital component called a flip-flop. And in those days, uh, a flip-flop uh, was a number of transistors, capacitors, and resistors on a single plug-in card. And um, I had to test uh, new type transistors and new type capacitors. And uh, it was a little bit difficult for a first year electrical engineering student who uh, hadn't had any electronics background at all. But uh, I was very fortunate to work in the laboratory with some very expert laboratory technicians who, uh, you know, picked me up and carried me by my elbows. Okay, and uh, then you uh, came to RCA. What uh, major projects did you work on? So, uh, I guess one of the uh, most exciting projects was one with the National Security Agency, and uh, we're pledged not to discuss exactly what we were doing with them, except that it was well known that we were building very exotic recording equipment uh, for them in their activities overseas. And then from there, where did you go? Well, uh, some of the more interesting assignments involved a video recording for the broadcast television industry. At that time, almost every TV station and every facility that made programs for TV used uh, an RCA television camera, especially after color television became very popular. Uh, but uh, there was always a host of video recording equipment to go with the TV cameras. And that was a split between the Ampex Corporation, a company that invented video recording, and RCA, the company who licensed Ampex for all the television circuits that were in the video recorders. And in essence, we split the market with uh, Ampex Corporation. So there was, for every time a, a network or a TV station wanted to buy recording equipment, there'd be a, a, a competition. And uh, that was where the fun began. Then what that led to was some exciting new technology in video recording and the creation of standards for the videotapes so that uh, the company that made the program and put it on tape could send it to a studio and the studio had a compatible video recorder to play it back. And uh, I became involved in the standards committees and this was a combination of the manufacturers, RCA and Ampex and others, and Sony, and the networks, CBS, NBC, ABC, which were the only networks at the time. And uh, 
that led to some very interesting uh, political uh, maneuvering. One, one example is uh, when high definition was first exhibited in Japan, it became all the rage. And the Standards Committee for determining the number of lines per picture height and the number of picture elements per picture width and the frame rates uh, were all very important issues that the Japanese wanted to solidify right around their development. But it didn't make sense from the point of view of users. So it became important for committee members like myself to help uh, guide the standard so that it would be maximally useful for the users, but also not such a burden that the manufacturers would have to redo everything they had done up to that time. And we had just come out with a new camera that uh, we were trying to sell all around the world. And the uh, head guy from the company in Japan called NHK, the, uh, uh, the uh, television big deal in Japan, said, we will buy your first production run of cameras if you convince your standards committee to use our format exactly as it is right now. And of course, we couldn't do that, but uh, I thought it was a very interesting ploy on their part. Now you uh, donated a color TV camera to us, um, a uh, charge couple device camera. Um, what was that about? Well, uh, we, we had uh, pioneered the use of computer controlled cameras that used conventional uh, tube pickups as the, uh, the sensitive device that converts images into electronics. Um, and then one of the engineers said, you know, that those tubes require a lot of circuitry for high voltage and um, control and complex computer. We, we could actually improve the imagery if we used a solid state device in, to replace the tubes. So uh, based on a lot of work done at the uh, Sarnoff Princeton Laboratories, they decided that charged coupled devices would be very appropriate to replace the tubes in a television camera. And they developed a, a, a very impressive model at Princeton. And then the engineers in Camden took that and actually made it into a camera and uh, took a model to the World Series and showed off one of the uh, big advantage of the solid state camera. And that was you could see the seams of the pitcher's pitch as it came toward home plate. And uh, once that was shown at the World Series, almost every uh, TV camera customer uh, around the United States called in and wanted to buy one right away. Of course, they weren't available for a number of years. But um, as a result of that development, we, we did have a production run of those solid state cameras. And in addition, uh, we won an Emmy Award, a uh, uh, Emmy Award for Engineering Achievement. And that went right on the tail of a previous Emmy Award we had won for the first uh, camera recorder. Uh, we, we made the, um, the tube type camera and a small video recorder into a single package that you could carry around on your shoulder, uh, including the battery. So, 
As far as your work at RCA, how did your career pro progress? Um, how was the experience? Well, um, when I graduated, uh, I became one of several thousand uh, engineers that were here in Camden. I remember uh, our first day uh, as a co-op student in the orientation, the, uh, the head person said, you're joining 16,000 people here in Camden. Not, and that wasn't including the several thousand that were in Moorestown at the time. So uh, being one of uh, several thousand engineers, you always wondered what was going to happen. And uh, the, uh, the whole idea was to uh, get your project done in a timely manner and uh, get the uh, circuit that you were working on as an electrical engineer uh, to uh, be completed in time to meet the uh, program schedule. And then to, uh, another point was to work with the mechanical engineers who had a, a difficult job of uh, putting these circuits onto circuit boards and into cabinets uh, to make the, uh, the project remain on schedule. Um, talk a little bit about your co-workers. How was it? Well, th that was uh, a very interesting thing. Uh, growing up in South Jersey, the only people I ever knew were people from the local area. But as soon as I became an engineer here, uh, the uh, engineers all around you were from New York State, uh, Wisconsin, Virginia, and uh, it was uh, exciting to meet people that you didn't grow up with. Uh, the, the thing I remember most about most of these uh, new engineers I met was how smart they were. The, um, the portion of the company called College Relations made it a point to try and hire number one or number two in their graduating class of electrical engineers or mechanical engineers, which were mainly the type of engineers we worked with on our projects. What about your supervisors? Well, uh, the one good thing that uh, where we were very fortunate in the uh, applied research group was that uh, the supervisors were all comparatively young. And uh, as soon as they reached 40, someone from one of the operating divisions would pluck them out into a bigger assignment, uh, either in Camden or Moorestown or maybe Indianapolis or Manhattan for a bigger job. And that always uh, left room for a younger guy to become a supervisor and then the young supervisor to become a, uh, a manager. So uh, as a result, um, you got to rub shoulders with these brilliant engineers who were always working their way up. Uh, you'd work with them two or three years and boom, they'd get a promotion to another uh, business. It sounds like there was a lot of hiring from within as far as the promotions went. Oh, definitely. It, it was very unusual to see an assignment of a manager or a vice president that came from outside the company. Uh, I think the priority in the, uh, we called it the personnel department at the time, I guess uh, it might be called human resources by now. Uh, but personnel seem to guide the presidents to uh, hire from within. Um, in several of the interviews, the term the RCA family has come up. What's that mean to you? Yeah, that, that, uh, that term, the RCA family, 
has great meaning because even though it was used uh, by the personnel department and um, and it was a, a talking point, uh, you really had the impression that it was true, that they considered you uh, more than just an employee. And um, even in meetings with your supervisor and in larger meetings where his supervisor would be present, uh, you had this feeling of a, of a true family. Um, I remember uh, once a week, the head of applied research, who was three levels up, would have a meeting with all the engineers and technicians. And he would give a little speech, and he would give out a piggy bank to each of the new fathers that were in the room. And uh, I think that was a, uh, a good example of how uh, everybody bought into the family concept. What about socializing outside of work? Well, uh, one nice thing was uh, every Friday we would get together and drive a couple blocks down into South Camden and go to a, uh, an Italian restaurant. And, sp and we always had an hour, a one-hour lunch period. And on Fridays, we might even extend it to one and a half hours. And uh, there would always be a group of 12, 16, 20 people sitting around a big table at the Italian restaurant in uh, South Camden. Um, and then uh, more than once a month, we would get together after work. Uh, during the uh, uh, layoff times, uh, when engineers would get better jobs elsewhere because they were on layoff, we would have these uh, great going away parties for them. Uh, and um, they were always fun. We all, we've also heard about um, Christmas Eve and the Christmas parties and things like that. Did you have any? Well, uh, I was uh, single for about 10 years after I started here. So those Christmas parties were always a joy for me because I was not obliged to go home uh, right after work. And uh, there was uh, always quite a bit of celebrating going on in the uh, Christmas parties. We've also had some suggestion that RCA had a significant influence on South Jersey. Do you have any, any input there? The, the, the one thing I remember is uh, the, the influence on Camden. Uh, on a Friday night, uh, which was payday for many of the employees, it was uh, difficult to walk along the sidewalk on uh, Broadway or Federal Street because uh, there were crowds out shopping uh, in the heart of Camden. And uh, this extended for blocks and blocks and blocks. Uh, and I attribute it, well, not only to RCA, but to uh, the other businesses in the city that included Campbell Soup. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, uh, how would you rate RCA among the industries? Well, uh, since it's the only place I ever worked, it's hard to compare uh, that. However, in comparing notes with customers and partners, uh, for example, we had a, uh, a very important customer, the uh, Lockheed Missile and Space Company in Sunnyvale, California. And uh, we worked closely with a number of their employees and we learned that um, we were a lot better off uh, than the average 
Lockheed employee. Uh, one of the things, of course, was the, uh, the family. Um, and the other was the way your uh, supervisor handled you, uh, which was uh, more paternal than uh, what you would learn in a business. What would you say was the best part of working for RCA? The money. <laughs> they, uh, RCA was not shy about uh, giving you a raise if uh, you warranted it. And uh, when I became a supervisor, uh, I never felt constrained about giving any of my engineers a raise if everyone felt they deserved it. Mm -hmm. What was the worst thing about working for RCA? Well, of course, the worst was uh, when large government contracts would come to an end and there had to be layoffs. And you had to spend hours and hours and hours in meetings making determinations of which engineers to keep and which engineers to let go. So how would you sum up your time at RCA? I thought it was terrific. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, one of the uh, uh, best things that ever happened to me was finally our uh, television equipment business had to close and uh, the president of our company, Joe Volpe, uh, instead of looking for a new job, he stayed with the group and made sure every single person in his huge uh, business had a job offer somewhere, whether it was inside RCA or from another company. And he never gave up until each person had a job. That says a lot. Any stories you remember, anything that uh, particularly stick out from, uh, from your experience? Wow. <laughs> but one of my um, favorite stories uh, involves a... Uh, a $2 billion competition for uh, five warships uh, for the country of Norway. And um, we had this uh, brilliant engineer who would travel with us to Norway. And uh, the Norwegians were extremely uh, technically oriented but they also um, had a budget. And uh, the uh, Norwegian engineers would ask these very, very difficult uh, technical questions. And uh, so um, one thing I made sure I did as the leader of the team uh, trying to win this competition was to make sure I had a uh, a fairly smart engineer with me to, to handle the uh, difficult questions. And uh, we came down to the final meeting where the Norwegians were going to decide between the, uh, the shipbuilder and the combat system supplier, the shipbuilder being the uh, Spanish shipyard, Bathan, and RCA, the uh, supplier of Aegis uh, naval combat systems, and a German uh, shipbuilder, and, uh, and the combat system supplier for that German shipbuilder. And uh, our, uh, our chief engineer, Lenny Wojten, got up in front of the Norwegians and uh, He's trying to paint this uh, picture of how uh, we have all these exotic, brand new computer programs 
and state-of-the-art computers. And uh, that uh, presentation went over very well. And we went back at night and we had to continue the presentation the next day. We got a phone call from home that said uh, the U.S. Navy will not let us uh, use those exotic computers or programs for the Norwegians. They have to use a uh, much older computer called a ANUYK-43. So the next morning, Lenny got up, he went in front of the group, and he told them how he had this uh, good idea overnight to save him some money and use this uh, very tried and true ANUYK-43 computer to house the uh, very mature computer programs uh, that were in use all over the world. And he never got a question from the uh, Norwegian engineers. They bought it and they gave us this $2 billion contract. <laughs> That's classic. I love it. All right. Well, that's good. Um, anything else that uh, that I haven't asked or that you have thought of that you want to add to the uh, the, 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 the one the one uh, thing that uh, I recall was that in the early days there was so much activity in Camden that it was very hard to drive to work. The roads were clogged because everybody either came to work at 7, 7.30 or 8 o'clock. And uh, a lot of uh, people had bought homes up in Willingboro. Uh, it might have been even called Levittown at the time. And the roads were so clogged that somebody bought a boat and he would take people from the dock here up to Willingboro on the Delaware River in his boat to avoid the uh, traffic jams coming back and forth. <laughs>